This is Dr. Joshua Cooper, and the purpose of this video is to help you think a little bit more in depth about reading EKGs, particularly with regard to the shape of the QRS complex. I find that when I understand how things work rather than memorize, it helps me to apply that knowledge to new situations and interpret things in greater depth and with greater accuracy. I'm hoping at the end of this video that you'll be able to be more confident in your EKG reading. Let's start with talking about the normal electrical system of the heart because that serves as the foundation from which all our understanding of the EKG arises. The sinus node which starts each heartbeat is in the top part of the right atrium near the superior vena cava. The tricuspid and mitral annuli normally serve as electrical barriers so that signals cannot get through from atrium to ventricle across those barriers, but instead electrical signals must pass through the normal electrical system of the heart, which consists of the AV node, the bundle of Hiss, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. The latter part of this electrical system I like to think about as an electrical tree, and we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about this tree when it works properly and when it doesn't, and how that plays a role in how the QRS is formed. So what's the purpose of this his Purkinje system, our electrical tree? The purpose is to get electrical signals to all places in the ventricular muscle as quickly and as simultaneously as possible so that the muscle all squeezes in coordination at once. I like to think of the ventricular myocardium as a pond and electrical signals traveling across the myocardium as ripples traveling across the surface of a pond. If you want to get ripples to travel everywhere across the pond at once, you have to have a particular strategy. If you just plunk a stone in one end of the pond and let ripples travel across, it's going to take a certain amount of time in order to get that electrical signal or those ripples everywhere on the surface of the water. However, if you drop lots of stones all over the place at once, you're much more rapidly and more simultaneously going to get those ripples or those electrical signals to travel across the surface in a much shorter period of time. And that's the purpose of the his purkinje system. Another important point to consider when we're thinking about the QRS complex is how quickly signals travel across different types of tissue in the heart. The myocardium itself is made up of myocytes, which sit next to each other and electrically communicate with each other. And there's a certain speed that electrical signals can travel across myocardium. And that speed is about 0.3 to 0.4 meters per second. The his purkinje system, however, is lightning fast. Signals can travel down those long, quick fibers almost 10 times as quickly, about two to three meters per second. One more principle to understand about how the his purkinje tree works is that the trunk of the tree, the his bundle, and the proximal part of the bundle branches are encased in fibrous tissue, an insulating layer that prevents signals from traveling sideways into or out of those his purkinje fibers. And instead, signals travel in and out the ends of the fibers. That's an important principle as we'll discuss when we talk about the myocardium becoming depolarized or sometimes passive activation of the electrical tree in the backwards direction. Again, it's only the ends of the twigs, the ends of the branches that allow signals to travel in and out of the his purkinje system. So let's review a normal heartbeat starting in the sinus node. It fires first, signals sweep across the atria, you go down the AV node more slowly and then down the his purkinje system quickly and depolarize the myocardium throughout the right and the left ventricle relatively simultaneously. And as a result, you get a P wave from the atrium, a little delay between the P wave and the QRS complex as the signal goes down the AV node. That's a slow part of the conduction, the slowest part of the heart. And then the QRS complex itself is very skinny because of that his Purkinje tree simultaneously activating myocardium almost simultaneously. Let's think about when the tree doesn't work properly, what effect that has on the QRS complex. Here we have a right bundle branch block scenario. So with our tree, the right bundle branch is not working the signal will still travel down the his purkinje tree in the part that is working, that being the left bundle branch and the left ventricle, and that part of the septum will be activated very quickly. And then the signal will gradually travel through myocardium at a slower pace to activate the right ventricle, which had not been depolarized directly from the right bundle branch, which isn't working in this bundle branch block scenario. 
as a result, the QRS is going to be wider because it takes longer to depolarize the myocardium as a whole. Notice, by the way, that the first part of the QRS is pretty quick because that part is generated by the Hisperkinji system that is working, and the second part of the QRS is sort of more blunt and roundy and more slowly conducting because that reflects this part going through myocardium alone and not the Hisperkinji tree. Here are some real examples of a narrow QRS up top and a right bundle branch block on the bottom. The normal QRS complex is usually under 100 milliseconds, sometimes up to 120 milliseconds. And when you have an abnormally wide QRS, it's going to be usually longer or wider than 120 milliseconds, reflecting the delay in activation of part of the myocardium. The left bundle branch block scenario is basically the opposite, where the left bundle is not working. Signals travel quickly down the His bundle and the right bundle branch and those Purkinje fibers, and then slowly conduct over toward the left ventricle, where the myocardium conducts uh, from the septum over toward the lateral wall of the left ventricle. And again, the QRS is going to be wide, and again, the very first upstroke of the QRS is going to be pretty quick, and the latter part of the QRS is going to be more blunted, and overall, the QRS, of course, will be wider because of the greater amount of time it took to depolarize the myocardium as a whole. Here are some real life examples of a narrow QRS up top and a left bundle branch block QRS on the bottom. A lot of people, when they start reading EKGs, memorize what a right bundle branch block and a left bundle branch block QRS look like, particularly in lead V1. But I'd really like to help you understand why the QRS looks the way it does so you no longer have to memorize it and you can figure out and it actually is logical. Here is a CAT scan, of course, of the chest showing the heart, and we're looking up from the feet of the patient, and we can see that the EKG leads that we place would be running across the precordium like this. This is the right side of the patient, and V1 is placed in the fourth intercostal space just to the right of the sternum. V2 is just to the left of the sternum, and then, of course, across the torso in specific anatomic locations are the other precordial leads. The right ventricle is right behind the sternum, and the left ventricle is further back. And as I call them the right and left ventricle, realize that they're also the front and the back ventricle. The right ventricle, yes, it's more rightward, but it's also in the front. And this is critical to understanding bundle branch blocks and the shape of the QRS. Because here is the Hisperkinji system with the right and left bundles now anatomically displayed. And if you have a right bundle branch block, Again, that right bundle branch isn't working. You'll activate the ventricles through the left bundle branch first, and then the end of the QRS is going to be coming from the left ventricle toward the right ventricle, which isn't only left to right, but also back to front. And notice the relationship between the vector of this arrow and lead V1. The end of the QRS is coming toward V1 in this right bundle branch block scenario. So if you look at V1 on the EKG, the end of the QRS is going to be positive for this reason. Now you don't have to memorize the rabbit ears. You can remember with the right bundle branch block, the end of the QRS is coming forward toward the right ventricle and forward toward lead V1. The left bundle branch block scenario is exactly the opposite. The left bundle branch doesn't work. The signal comes down the right bundle branch, and then you travel through myocardium, going from the right ventricle toward the left ventricle, which is also from front to back or away from lead V1. So here is what the EKG looks like in V1 with a left bundle branch block pattern. The end of the QRS is going to be negative because you're traveling from right to left, but also from front to back away from V1, which is a negative vector in that lead. It's also possible for a sub-branch to not work properly. For example, instead of the entirety of the left bundle branch not working, you can have one of its two fascicles not working. The left bundle branch is made up of an anterior and a posterior fascicle. And so let's think about what happens when only one of those fascicles isn't working. This is a left posterior fascicular block scenario, and let's make that disappear. Here we have a sinus beat that conducts down and it goes down the Hisperkinji tree after going through the AV node. And notice here that even though one of the fascicles isn't working, the other one is, as is the right bundle. So you have 
signals reaching the left and the right ventricles pretty quickly down the branches of the tree that work. As a result, you actually get a very narrow QRS because it's only part of the left bundle that isn't working and the rest of it does activate the left ventricle pretty quickly. So you will have a skinny QRS, but the vector, the direction that it's uh, aiming is going to be different because you are activating the left ventricle in a bit of a different direction. So in the fascicular block scenario, you don't get a wide QRS for this reason. Both the right and the left ventricles do have Purkinje fibers going to them, but the axis of the QRS in the limb leads is going to change significantly, and there are particular criteria to help you identify when this is present. And this is what a left posterior fascicular block would look like on an EKG. The QRS is skinny, but the axis in the limb leads is abnormal. It's more rightward than it should be. Normally, your QRS complex is positive in lead one and positive in lead two. Here, lead two is certainly positive, but lead one is actually more negative than positive. That tells us that the vector, instead of traveling in the normal quadrant between zero and 90 degrees, is gonna be beyond 90 degrees, traveling down toward the right leg, making the uh, inferior leads very positive, AVL quite negative, and even lead one negative. This is a clue that tells us that we have a left posterior fascicular block. You can actually have something called bifascicular block as well. One of the left fascicles may not work and the right bundle may not work. So two out of the three components of the his Purkinje tree may not work. Let's look at what that scenario looks like. You're gonna come down the AV node and the his bundle and that one remaining fascicle and stimulate that part of the heart relatively quickly, but the right ventricle is gonna be activated more slowly and late. So as you might guess, this does give you a wide QRS because you don't have Purkinje fibers heading over toward the right ventricle. You're also gonna get an abnormal axis of the QRS because of that fascicular block. So this is sort of a combination of what a right bundle branch block would look like, but also an axis shift from a, a fascicular block uh, as part of the left bundle not working. And here's what a bifascicular block EKG would look like with a right bundle branch block and a left anterior fascicular block. We know the right bundle branch block is present because we look at V1 and we review that because the end of the QRS is positive, that tells us that you have a back to front left ventricle toward right ventricle vector at the end of the QRS because the right bundle branch isn't working. But we also have at the first part of the QRS in the limb leads, a very negative deflection in lead two, which normally should be positive if you didn't have that fascicular block. It's positive in one, it's positive in AVL, but very negative in lead two, which is abnormal. Uh, and it reflects this left anterior fascicular block, giving you a significant left axis deviation. Let's switch gears for a moment and talk about the QRS complex in the context of AV block and escape rhythms. So if you have sinus rhythm and you have heart block where signals are not able to get from top to bottom, then something has to tell the bottom chambers to fire. And different people have different locations that have the capability of kicking in and serving as a substitute pacemaker when heart block is present but it's hard to know, and it varies from person to person, which component below the level of block is going to take over as a substitute pacemaker. In many people who have heart block, especially those who develop heart block in the AV node itself, the His bundle itself can actually serve as a new substitute pacemaker, and it can fire at a slower pace than the sinus node was firing, but it can keep the heart going and prevent asystole. When the His bundle itself fires spontaneously, it will send signals down the entirety of the His Purkinje tree. And as a consequence, the QRS complexes will be completely narrow, just like in sinus rhythm with intact conduction. You won't necessarily have a P wave in front of each QRS because the His bundle is firing on its own. And here's what that would look like. This is complete heart block or third degree AV block with a junctional escape rhythm with firing at the level of the His bundle. First notice there are P waves marching through 
and they have no relationship to the QRS complexes. The QRS complexes, which are narrow because the entirety of the tree is being used to generate that QRS because it's the Hiss bundle that's firing and it travels down an intact tree, that is firing at a particular pace in whatever rate this person's Hiss bundle likes to fire. And thankfully it kicked in to prevent asystole. And this person was able to come into the hospital, maybe not feeling that great, but certainly not having fainted or lost consciousness because their heart rate is reasonable in getting blood flow to the brain and the rest of the body. Well, what if somebody has AV block, but the Hiss bundle for some reason in this patient is not capable of taking over as a substitute pacemaker spot? Here we have heart block. And let's think about what else might be able to kick in. Some people, it's further downstream in the his Purkinje system that a rescue spot kicks in. For example, here in one of the fascicles. So if that fires, it has implications on what that escape rhythm QRS is going to look like. It will travel forward down just that branch of the his Purkinje tree, and then it'll travel over toward the rest of the myocardium, and it will give you a wider QRS with a right or a left bundle branch block like pattern or a bifascicular block pattern, depending on what part of the tree is firing, which branch. Here's an example of that, complete heart block, third degree AV block with a fascicular escape rhythm. Notice again, the P waves are marching through. At first glance, you might think that it looks like there is a relationship between the P and the QRS, but notice that as you go toward this tracing, they're migrating closer together and it would continue until the P wave would sort of pass the QRS and go beyond it. So there's no relationship here. If you put calipers on the P waves and calipers on the QRS complexes, they have totally different rates and they have nothing to do with each other mathematically. And notice again that the QRS is wide with the terminal part of the QRS in V1 being positive, just like a right bundle branch block. And that is because it is a left fascicle that is firing, mimicking what a right bundle branch block QRS would look like because you're activating the ventricle in a very similar way. Well, what if neither the His bundle nor one of the Purkinje fibers is able to kick in as an escape rhythm. Some people, their conduction system just doesn't do that, doesn't behave that way. So here we have heart block, and then we have to hope that some part of the myocardium kicks in. And let's say it's over here, and you're gonna get a much wider QRS that doesn't have a rapid initial component, and it's gonna depend on whatever spot is firing, what shape and vector that QRS will take. It's important to recognize that the further down you get in the his Purkinje system, the slower the escape rhythm and the less reliable it tends to be. So if you have somebody who's in heart block with narrow QRSs at a particular rate, let's say 50 beats per minute, that tends to be quite reliable. And it's unlikely that person is gonna suddenly have a slower heart rate uh, with a dangerous situation. And similarly, uh, the fascicles tend to be pretty reliable when they fire, albeit usually slower than the his bundle tends to fire. When you get so far downstream, because that's the only thing that has the capability of kicking in as, as an escape rhythm, you get even slower. And when you see a wide, slow QRS as your escape, you do start to worry more that that might not keep up for the duration of time until you get a pacemaker into this patient. So it is important to recognize where the escape focus is because it might inform your urgency with which you would call the EP service, get a pacemaker implanted. Here's an example of somebody with complete heart block. And again, those are the P waves marching through and now an even slower and wide QRS complex escape. This is a ventricular escape rhythm. Notice the wide QRS here and how slow it's going. This is somebody that you might watch very closely and maybe even consider being ready to do temporary pacing and or prioritize getting a permanent pacemaker uh, implanted. Let's move on to uh, ventricular ectopy, PVCs, and ventricular tachycardia and think about what makes the QRS look the way it does in these scenarios. When you have a PVC fire, it doesn't usually use the His Purkinje system at all. So instead of seeing a nice narrow QRS, because the tree is being used with a PVC that comes from the myocardium, the tree is not used at all. So now we're in that scenario 
kind of like a stone being dropped in one location in the pond and sending ripples across the pond in all directions from that single spot. So you're going to get a much wider QRS because you have no ability to simultaneously activate the muscle because you're doing it from only that one location. So here's a PVC focus and it travels out in all directions and as a consequence you have a QRS that is wide. Here's an example of two sinus beats conducting down the Hisperkinji system, each one giving a narrow QRS here, 90 milliseconds, followed by a PVC as the third beat on this EKG, much wider at 150 milliseconds. And again, the only reason why that PVC is wider is that it is not using the Hisperkinji tree. It is activating the myocardium from one spot and using only myocardial conduction speed to get that signal across the entirety of the ventricles. Let's think about the location of the PVC. If a PVC comes from the lateral wall of the right ventricle, then it has to sequentially activate the right ventricle, then the septum, and then the left ventricle. And that will take sort of the maximal amount of time because you're plunking that stone all the way at one end of the pond. And it'll give you a wide QRS, in fact, the widest that you can really make. And similarly, if you have a PVC coming from the lateral wall of the left ventricle, you're again going to sequentially activate the left ventricle and then the septum and then the right ventricle. The vector will look different, the shape will look different, but the width will still be wide because of that sequential activation of each ventricle one at a time. It's like you're plunking a stone in the opposite end of the pond. But what if you plunk the stone right in the center of the pond from the septum in this case? Then you're going to be able to simultaneously activate the right ventricle and the left ventricle, and that actually can take a shorter amount of time because you're having wave fronts travel in parallel to both ventricles rather than in sequence. So in this case, even if you're not using the Hisperkinji tree, a PVC coming from the septum is going to be skinnier than a PVC coming from the lateral wall of either ventricle. Here's an example on the top of a, PV, of a sinus bead and then a PVC that came from the septum, and on the bottom, we have a sinus beat followed by a PVC that came from the lateral wall, and the width of each PVC is different. The one up top from the septum is only 135 milliseconds, and the one at the bottom is 180 milliseconds, again, because of the location of origin of the PVC. As I mentioned, the PVC shape is going to be determined by the location that the PVC originates. And in the EP world, we like to think about that because in patients where we need to treat the PVCs because of symptoms or because they're causing a cardiomyopathy because they're coming with great frequency, uh, we like to plan and know if we're going to do catheter ablation, where we're going to need to get our catheter in order to be successful to find the PVC and ablate it. There are very typical places that PVCs tend to come from and they have very characteristic shapes on the 12 lead EKG. The most common places that PVCs come from are the right ventricular outflow tract, the left ventricular outflow tract, the tricuspid and mitral annuli, and the papillary muscles of the left ventricle, and sometimes even the trabeculations or papillary muscles of the right ventricle, including the moderator band, which runs across the right ventricle near its apex. There are lots of manuscripts and descriptions out there of what PVCs look like that come from different places. Here is a detailed article that talks about the right ventricular outflow tract and the various flavors of PVC shape that can occur, whether the PVC is coming from the free wall of the right ventricular outflow tract or the septal aspect of it, the posterior or more rightward aspect or the anterior or more leftward aspect. And there are some commonalities because these are all relatively close to each other, but there are differences as well so that you can pinpoint the exact location based on the shape. Similarly, if you have a PVC coming from the posteromedial papillary muscle of the left ventricle, there are uh, various morphologies that you can see that have common themes, but there can be slight variations depending on where the papillary muscle is sitting and what side of the papillary muscle the PVC is coming from or whether it's the tip or the base of that papillary muscle.
And lastly, just briefly mention, the base of the left ventricle also has characteristic shapes. But the purpose of this is not to go through all of these shapes, but just to, again, reinforce basic principles. So here in this paper, it reviewed base of the left ventricle PVCs. But if you look at the lateral uh, mitral annular PVC morphology, that comes from over there. Here, this, uh, this is a cartoon image where we're kind of looking uh, through the mitral annulus into the left ventricle, sort of from the head of the patient. Um, the PVC will have one particular shape um, and a particular width. Uh, and if you have a septal PVC coming from that aspect uh, of the base of the left ventricle, it'll have a very different shape. But notice, just as I said before, the principles of activation of the myocardium are the same. If you have a PVC coming from the lateral wall of the left ventricle, it's going to be wider, as shown in the orange brackets here. Whereas if you're coming from the septum and activate both ventricles at the same time, it's going to be narrower. So that's the main takeaway from these papers, is that you can tell where the PVC is coming from, including such simple things as the width of the QRS telling you how septal versus lateral you are in one of the ventricles. Let's think about tachycardia that actually comes not from the myocardium, but from one of the fascicles itself, a fascicular tachycardia. We talked about a fascicular escape rhythm, but you can have either a tiny short circuit or a firing spot within the Hisperkinji system, let's say here in this branch, and it fires quickly, causing a type of ventricular tachycardia called fascicular tachycardia. Well, what's that going to look like? Not a surprise after the first slides of this lecture where we talked about bundle branch blocks and escape rhythms, this is going to activate that branch of the Hisperkinji tree and then activate the rest of the myocardium in a slower fashion. And you're going to get, in this case, what looks like a right bundle branch block QRS morphology, but it's going to be firing quickly. Here's an example of a left anterior fascicular ventricular tachycardia. And if you didn't know better, you'd look at this and you'd say, wow, this looks like a right bundle branch block, and it is because you have that end of the QRS being positive in V1, and the first part of the QRS is pretty quick, pretty skinny, and in fact, you wouldn't be faulted for looking at this and thinking, well, this looks like some kind of supraventricular tachycardia that's conducting down with a right bundle branch block. But this is another EKG skill that you'll need to cultivate, which is to find P waves, which is difficult when they're falling on top of T waves and even more difficult when they're falling on top of QRS complexes. But let me point them out to you here in the rhythm strip and lead two in the bottom. You can see an extra hump that is present here and absent there and present here and absent there. And you can march them through with your calipers and see that in fact, those are P waves here it is between the QRS and the ST segment and the T wave itself. And they are marching sort of independently of the much faster uh, QRS complexes. So you have AV dissociation with more ventricular events than atrial events. And that by definition is ventricular tachycardia. But the shape of the QRS here with the first part being quick and the latter part looking like a right bundle branch block shape tells us that this is a fascicular ventricular tachycardia. Um, and the reason why is, as I showed, it's originating in the Hisperkinji system and creating the shape that is very similar to a bundle branch block looking QRS. And here's one step more tricky. You can have the His bundle itself fire quickly. And again, we reviewed this as an escape focus in the setting of heart block, but you can have a junctional tachycardia where the His bundle area fires repeatedly very quickly. And that would give you, as you might expect, a completely narrow QRS complex because it travels down the entirety of the Hisperkinji tree and activates the ventricular muscle all at once. But it'll be quick if we're talking about a tachycardia. And here's an example of that. And even more challenging to make this diagnosis of a flavor of ventricular tachycardia, which is really what this is, you'd look at this and you'd immediately think at first glance that this has to be supraventricular because the QRSs are so narrow. But again, the key here is finding the P waves. And let me point them out to you here. You can see here at the bottom that you have an extra little blip here 
in the ST segment that is absent on this beat. And here is a little bite taken out at the beginning of the T wave, and it's absent here, but there is a little exaggeration at the end of the QRS here, um, and, and so on and so forth. So here you have um, more QRS complexes than you have P waves, and that tells us that this is not a supraventricular tachycardia, but instead the ventricles are going faster than the atria. But we know but be, that because this is such a narrow QRS, it has to be using the Hisperkinji tree, and that defines this as a junctional tachycardia. Let's talk a little bit more about ventricular tachycardia and some clues uh, that ventricular tachycardia is going on based on the shape of QRS complexes. So here we have a tachycardia with a wide QRS, and I'll point out the P waves here with arrows showing AV dissociation. The ventricular events are happening faster than the atrial events, so this is ventricular tachycardia. And the reason that the QRS complexes are wide is that the Hisperkinji system is not being used. So it's kind of like having a lot of PVCs in a row where the origin is from the myocardium itself and you have wave fronts sweeping across the myocardium at that slower pace resulting in a wide QRS. But the question arises, what's going on here with this beat? It's suddenly you have a skinnier beat thrown in in the mix during ongoing ventricular tachycardia. Well, it's not a coincidence that there's a P wave that comes right in front of that skinnier beat. And what's happening here is with a well-timed sinus beat, even though sinus rhythm is happening slower than the ventricular tachycardia, if one of the sinus beats falls in a perfect window of time that it's able to conduct down the AV node and Hisperkinji system and sneak in a beat that sort of ties with one of the ventricular beats that's coming from the ongoing VT, you can get what's called a fusion beat that will introduce that concept here. Fusion means that more than one thing is happening to depolarize chambers at the same time. And I'm gonna draw it like this. Here we can see the VT focus ongoing as shown in green. But if you have a sinus beat that comes down and depolarizes via part of the Hisperkinji tree, whatever part that VT beat hadn't reached, then you're going to get myocardium that's activated in two different ways at the same time. And whenever you do that, you're actually creating a more simultaneous activation, which results in a narrower QRS. So this is a clue that this is ventricular tachycardia. Even if you hadn't seen the P waves well, let's say they're really small and you couldn't identify them, but you saw a wide complex tachycardia and then occasionally there was a skinnier beat the skinnier beat tells you there's fusion going on. So if that is a beat that in part is coming from above, from sinus rhythm conducting down, then the only other thing that could be making the QRS um, uh, appear fused and not completely narrow is a ventricular beat. So it sort of directly implies that there is a rhythm coming from the ventricles that is competing from the occasional sinus beat that's getting through. Here's another example of that where you see wide complex beats, ventricular tachycardia, with a couple narrow beats kind of mixed in. And those are again, fusion beats. And those are one clue that you may find to tell you that this is ventricular tachycardia that is fused on occasion with a sinus beat that's coming through. You can actually see those P waves. Here, there's a P wave here in the top lead here. Here you can see that little hump in the bottom lead. There's another P wave over there. So we have, again, AV dissociation. But when that P wave comes at just the perfect time, it's able to fuse. And here again, the P wave is able to fuse. Uh, this one came too late uh, to do it, and others may come too early. But fusion is a key to diagnosing ventricular tachycardia, especially if P waves are not obvious. Another concept of differentiating wide complex tachycardias is whether you're looking at a supraventricular tachycardia with a bundle branch block, aberrancy. Right bundle branch block and left bundle branch block together are known as aberrant conduction or aberrancy. So a wide complex tachycardia could be SVT with aberrancy or ventricular tachycardia. And this goes back in terms of differentiating them. One of the clues here is going back to a concept I mentioned at the very beginning, where I said when you have a right or a left bundle branch block, the first part of the QRS is really quick, and the second part of the QRS is sort of slow. And take a look at that here in this EKG. Um, here, look at this 
intrinsicoid deflection, that's the first part of the QRS, is really quick, and the second part is kind of slow. And that's true in a lot of these, especially across the precordium, it's pretty obvious that the first part of the QRS is quick. And here, in fact, from the beginning of the QRS, the beginning of the R wave, down to the depth of the S wave is only 80 milliseconds or slightly less. Uh, that's quick. And that is a big clue that we're dealing here, we think, with uh, the conduction system uh, being engaged, which uh, is usually SVT with aberrancy. Now, it, of course, could also be a fascicular ventricular tachycardia, as we've discussed, but that's less common than SVT with a bundle branch block. Here, in contrast, is ventricular tachycardia that doesn't use the Hisperkinji system at all, and therefore, right from the start of the QRS, you don't have any quick part it's just slow. Notice how gradual the intrinsicoid deflection, the upstroke is of these QRSs. There's no quickness to that whatsoever. And if I zoom in on one of them, we can see here the beginning of the QRS, the beginning of this R wave down to the depth of the S wave is much, much longer here, 180 milliseconds. So the question is, how do you quantify uh, quick versus not quick? Well, some of the VT versus SVT algorithms sort of have specific numbers. Um, and, and this is to help you differentiate SVT from VT. And look at one of the criteria here, for example, if you have an R to S time in any of the precordial leads, V1 to V6, that's over 100 milliseconds, then that tells us that it's ventricular tachycardia, meaning the first part of the QRS right from the get-go is wide. That tells us that his Purkinje system is not being used, and therefore this is ventricular tachycardia. Notice that the opposite is not true. If the R to S is less than 100, this algorithm doesn't tell you it's SVT because it could be a fascicular uh, ventricular tachycardia. But if it's wide, then that really rules out the Hisperkinji system being used, and that should tell you that it's really ventricular tachycardia, almost always. And here, when you look at the morphology criteria, when you get to that part of the algorithm, again, there is some quantification of what is quick mean at the beginning of the QRS. Here, if you have an initial R wave, when you have a left bundle branch block type QRS that's more than 30 milliseconds wide, or an R to S in V1 or V2, that is greater than 60 milliseconds, those are clues that you're dealing with ventricular tachycardia. And again, this speaks to the fact that the beginning of the QRS is not quick, and therefore we're not using the Hisperkinji system, and therefore it must be coming from ventricular muscle, uh, being ventricular tachycardia almost always. There Again, there are exceptions to every rule. Let's move on to one of my favorite topics, which is WPW, Wolf Parkinson White, and pre-excitation of the ventricle with an accessory pathway. Again, let's review one more time what normal conduction looks like when you have a sinus node firing and conduction from atrium to ventricle down the normal Hisperkinji system. And we talked so much about the narrow QRS, but let's talk for a moment about the EV node component of things. When you have a P wave and a QRS complex, I did briefly mention at the beginning that there is a delay between the two. And that delay between the P wave and the QRS reflects slow conduction in the AV node, and the AV node does not create any deflection on the surface EKG. The amount of tissue is too small, and the signals are traveling too slowly for it to generate anything on the EKG. So it shows up as a flat line while signals are traveling through that AV node. Now, if you have an accessory pathway, what that means is you have a rapidly conducting uh, slip of tissue that kind of behaves a little bit like a Purkinje fiber, um, and it has a connection on the atrial side of the valve and the ventricular side of the valve. And this can be on the mitral valve side of things or the tricuspid valve side of things, but this is a second way that signals can travel between atrium and ventricle or ventricle and atrium aside from the AV node in the Hisperkinji system. So let's think of a, a hypothetical scenario where let's say the AV node isn't working. What would the QRS look like during sinus rhythm if you conducted only over this accessory pathway rather than the AV node in the Hisperkinji system? And you'll see why we're breaking it down like this. So here's sinus rhythm, and a signal travels down that accessory pathway, and it inserts directly into muscle. 
and does not use the Hisperkinji tree. This QRS is going to look exactly like a PVC would if a PVC were coming from the location of where that accessory pathway is inserting into ventricular muscle, which means you're going to have a wide QRS. Interestingly, in addition to that, you're going to have a very short PR interval. Why? Because, as I said, the AV node is not participating in electrical conduction from atrium to ventricle, and the accessory pathway is much faster than the AV node conducts. So the two features of conduction over only an accessory pathway are going to be the absence of a delay between the P wave and the QRS, and a very wide QRS that looks just like a PVC. We can actually create this scenario in somebody who has WPW. If you give adenosine, it will temporarily completely block the AV node, and the shape and timing looks exactly as I just described. Here I'm going to zoom in and pardon the pixelation here, but here we have a P wave and a QRS that's conducting only over an accessory pathway because we used adenosine to block the AV node. Notice there's really no PR interval delay, and the QRS here looks like a PVC beat, basically, a wide beat that does not use the Hisperkinji system at all. Well, what's the QRS going to look like if we now conduct down both the accessory pathway and the AV node in Hisperkinji tree? And we're going to get back to this concept of fusion, because here we're going to be activating the ventricles in two different ways, just like during VT with an occasional beat that sneaks in through the AV node in Hisperkinji system. But now we're going to have fusion on every single beat, and it's going to look something like this. Here's the sinus node firing. It sends wavefronts down toward both the accessory pathway and the AV node, which both send signals down to the ventricle, and you're going to depolarize some of the ventricle through one and some of the ventricular muscle through the other. And I sort of displayed that, as you can see, with a region of pink that was activated through the accessory pathway and a region of yellow that was activated through the Hisperkinji tree. So what is this fused QRS going to look like? Well, it's going to be a blend of what it would look like if you only conducted down the Hisperkinji system and what it would look like if you conducted only down the accessory pathway. Let's smush them together. This is what WPW looks like when you conduct down both an accessory pathway and the Hisperkinji system. So why does it look like this? Well, first of all, the PR interval is going to be very short because the signal was being delayed in the AV node, but while that was happening, the wavefront could reach the accessory pathway, not be delayed, and start the QRS going pretty quickly. So just like the scenario of where you're only conducting on the accessory pathway, that's how the QRS is going to start. But when the Hisperkinji system catches up, it's much faster than myocardial conduction only. So the second part of the QRS is going to be actually pretty quick. The way this is often described is they say this is a QRS that has what's called a delta wave, this extra slopey thing at the beginning of the QRS with a short PR interval. And this is the reason why. It's because you have fusion between the accessory pathway part of activating the myocardium and the Hisperkinji system that is really quick that catches up after that initial delay from the AV node. And again, this is called fusion, and it's going to occur on every single beat in most patients who have accessory pathways that can conduct in the forward direction. So here are real-life examples of all three scenarios. The top we're used to at this point, the normal PR interval and normal narrow QRS in the absence of WPW. This is an interesting case of a patient who had a, an ablation procedure where the AV node was injured uh, temporarily, and there was conduction over only the accessory pathway. And here in the middle, we have that delta wave. We have that scenario where you conduct initially down the accessory pathway, and then the Hisperkinji system catches up. This is classic WPW, and this is a fusion beat between accessory pathway and narrow QRS, and this is what you'll commonly see in patients with ventricular preexcitation. Not everybody who has pre-excitation has a QRS that looks the same. It's going to depend on the location of the pathway and how quickly the AV node versus the pathway are able to conduct signals down to the ventricle, which will determine the relative contributions of each.
So for example, here is a patient who has a left-sided accessory pathway, and notice that the delta wave is very uh, subtle. You can see that, yes, the PR is short, but that little delta wave slopey part is, is very minimal, and then the QRS gets pretty skinny and quick uh, relatively soon thereafter. Well, why is that the case with a left-sided pathway? Um, here is a visual explanation of why this is so. We discussed that there's a delay when the AV node is conducting that gives a head start to the accessory pathway, but with a left-sided pathway, it is so far away from the sinus node that there's also a little bit of a delay because of the signal having to travel across more atrial muscle to even get to the pathway, and that partially compensates for the delay that was happening in the AV node, and the AV node was actually reached sooner because it's closer to the sinus node compared to the accessory pathway. So left-sided, left lateral pathways in particular tend to have more subtle delta waves. And sometimes it's very difficult to see it at all, especially if the pathway doesn't conduct quite as quickly and or the AV node conducts more quickly. The AV node will have, at least timing-wise, a bit of a head start because of its relative location. So this is pretty characteristic appearance of left-sided accessory pathway delta waves. In contrast, here's a young woman with a right-sided accessory pathway that was really close to the sinus node. In fact, it almost looks like it's fully pre-excited um, and, and without much contribution of the uh, AV node and Hisperkinji system. And it just has to do with the relative location of each with regard to the sinus node. So here, um, not only does the accessory pathway have a head start because it doesn't have the same delay that the AV node does, but it also has a head start because it's closer. Um, so here with a right-sided pathway, this is a pretty dramatic example, but right-sided pathways tend to give you much wider QRSs and much bigger delta waves uh, because of this reason. Again, the proximity to the sinus node. One more point to make about delta waves and Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. So here is a, another patient who has a delta wave. You can see that short PR interval and the slurred upstroke here during sinus rhythm. And this patient um, has had palpitations. And at times, they go into a type of SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, that's known as AVRT, atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia. That means a short circuit that involves the accessory pathway. And here is that patient in tachycardia. Notice the delta wave disappeared. What happened to it? We have sort of a squared off segment flat line and then an abrupt sharp initiation of the QRS. You can see the P waves here, which are not sinus P waves, it's negative in the inferior leads. That's not a sinus P wave. That'll be a topic for a whole other talk. But the QRS lost its delta wave. And the question is, why does that happen during tachycardia? Here is just a side-by-side -side comparison where you can see during sinus rhythm on the left, very clear delta waves. And uh, during SVT on the right, complete absence of delta waves, pretty dramatic difference. So let's review what happens during AVRT to uh, understand why the delta waves disappear. So here is the circuit that occurs during AVRT. You have the signal traveling down the Hisperkinji system, across ventricular muscle, and then backwards up the accessory pathway. This is the loop, this is the short circuit that occurs when you have SVT involving an accessory pathway. We call it orthodromic AVRT. Orthodromic meaning it's going forward down the Hisperkinji system, traveling across myocardium, and then up the accessory pathway to the atrium. But I recognize that what I just said is that we are activating the accessory pathway in the backwards direction during SVT, which is different and opposite from during sinus rhythm. Here we have activation of the Hisperkinji tree in the forward direction during SVT, but there is no pink section, there's no fusion, there's no contribution because we're activating the accessory pathway. And here is that comparison side by side on the left showing sinus rhythm where you have fusion with forward conduction down the Hisperkinji system and down the, down the accessory pathway, giving you a delta wave. And here, because you have this short circuit, 
going retrograde over the accessory pathway. We do not have a delta wave, and that explains the difference. It's the direction of the accessory pathway conduction. Let's move on to the last topic uh, of talking about QRS morphology and width, and that is ventricular pacing, yet another way that ventricular myocardium can be activated aside from native conduction or accessory pathways or spontaneous beats. And we're also going to talk about cardiac resynchronization, which is pacing from more than one location. So let's start with just simple right ventricular pacing, which is the most common location that a pacemaker lead is placed in the right ventricular apex. If we stimulate the heart from that pacing location, we of course are not using the His Purkinje tree. We're pacing from that spot just like a PVC that could come from that spot would stimulate the myocardium. And you're going to get conduction simply across myocardial tissue with that slower conduction velocity. And accordingly, just like with a PVC, you're going to get a wide QRS because you're activating the myocardium sequentially and entirely through myocardial conduction and not from multiple places at once. Um, you could also see on the surface EKG a pacer spike. This little quick deflection is a, a, a representation of electrical activity that stimulated the myocardium. And sometimes that can be pretty small and difficult to see on the surface EKG, but it's often visible. And that's a clue that we're not dealing simply with a PVC beat, but in fact a paste beat because you see that pacing artifact. Let's look at a scenario in a patient with a pacemaker who is also in atrial fibrillation. Pacemakers work by preventing the heart from going below a certain rate. So if the native heartbeat tries to fall below a programmed rate in the pacemaker, then the pacemaker will kick in, give a little electrical signal and create a QRS complex. But if a native beat comes through on its own and the pacemaker sees that beat, then usually the pacemaker will not pace, it will what's called inhibit, and it will allow that beat to simply occur. Notice on this short strip, we have three different shapes of QRS complexes, and let's review each of them and why they have a particular shape and a particular width. Let's start with the type of beat we just discussed, a paste beat, where you can see a pacing artifact here and a wide QRS. In fact, the QRS is 160 milliseconds wide, not at all surprising because we're pacing in the myocardium in the right ventricle, and that signal sweeps across myocardium, causing a wide QRS. Uh, here is a native beat in atrial fibrillation. It comes irregularly and it conducts down the full His Purkinje tree and therefore has a narrow width. But what about that third beat at the end of the page here? This doesn't really look like either the paste beat or the native beat. In fact, it kind of looks like a blend between the two. If we look at its width, it is also kind of partway between the two other beats that we have on the page. This is yet another type of fusion. There are two things happening in the ventricles at the same time by coincidence. We have a paste beat because you can see a pacemaker spike occurring, but this doesn't have the full appearance of a paste beat. It's narrower than that. And that's because by chance during atrial fibrillation, there was a native narrow beat that occurred and happened to occur within the QRS complex, creating fusion. And as we said before, if you have multiple things happening, it can only speed up the conduction in myocardium as a whole and make the QRS more narrow. And therefore this fusion beat is narrower than the uh, the paste beat, where it's only the pacing site that stimulates myocardium. It's important to recognize fusion beats when they exist, because otherwise you might be confused as to what's going on in terms of pacemaker function. So here's what this would look like uh, in the same type of figure that I've shown before. Here is a paste beat that maybe happens at the same time that you get His Purkinje activation. And just like I showed fusion with WPW, here we have fusion with pacing. But the origin here is not up at the base of the heart where the accessory pathway is, but instead wherever the myocardial lead, the ventricular lead is placed here at the right ventricular apex. So we have wave fronts that propagate out in all directions from that pacing site. And if we happened to have a superventricular beat conduct down at the same time, then it may take over some of the myocardium. And again, you get fusion 
uh, with a blended QRS that looks partway between the paste beat and partway between native conduction. Now, depending on the relative timing of those things, you might see a more narrow QRS if there's more yellow and you, you get the native beat coming through earlier in the pacing uh, in the, compared to the paste beat, or it may come right at the end and you have a wider beat that looks more like exclusive pacing that may be changed only a little bit. Again, with right ventricular pacing, let's talk about what happens in terms of the sequence of activation. We've talked a lot about electrical conduction and the electrical uh, happenings with this paced beat, but let's think for a moment about the physical happenings. When you pace in the right ventricular apex and that wave front sweeps across the myocardium from the right ventricle to the septum and finally to the lateral wall of the left ventricle, you're going to get um, sequential mechanical contraction rather than simultaneous mechanical contraction of the walls of the left ventricle. Normally, the septum and the lateral wall will squeeze at about the same time because the Hisperkinji network is sending fibers to both parts of the ventricular muscle or all parts of the ventricular muscle pretty simultaneously. But that's not true when you have right ventricular apical pacing. In that scenario, as I said, you're going to reach that electrically and reach that lateral base of the uh, left ventricle late, and accordingly, it's going to squeeze late. So you're going to get sequential squeezing because of sequential activation of the walls of the left ventricle. That can make the left ventricle less efficient. And in many people, and people with normal hearts, it may not be a big deal to have a fraction of a second difference between the septum and the lateral wall. But in people who have a weakened heart, a cardiomyopathy, a reduced ejection fraction, that lack of coordination is a much bigger deal. And in fact, it can worsen the ejection fraction and it can worsen congestive heart failure because heart function is less efficient. So the reason that biventricular pacing was developed was specifically to address this electrical dyssynchrony the sequential activation of walls of the left ventricle and therefore the mechanical sequential contraction of walls of the left ventricle. We want to try to do something with pacing to bring in that lateral base of the heart earlier and stimulate it earlier. And the way we do that is by putting a second pacemaker lead over in that location and plug both pacemaker leads into the pacemaker and now it can pace from more than one location at once. Not only will it pace from the right ventricular apex, but it can also pace from the base, that late part that was being activated and with a delay from the right ventricular lead. We now don't have to wait for the wavefront to get there. We can actually stimulate that part earlier with this left ventricular lead. So if we pace from two locations, we're going to get another type of fusion. Here we have activation of different parts of the myocardium from the two different sites, and therefore you'll get a blended QRS complex that will reflect the contributions of each of those pacing sites. Here is an example of a patient who has, as I showed before, only right ventricular pacing with a single pacemaker spike and a very wide QRS. And here's somebody who we're pacing from two locations. There are two pacer spikes here. I'll talk in a moment about the timing between the two, but a narrower QRS because we're able to more simultaneously activate the walls of the ventricular myocardium uh, in a, a faster time frame. Here is somebody on telemetry who is undergoing testing of their biventricular device, and we can see a transition from biventricular pacing where you see two pacemaker spikes both activating parts of the ventricle and a pretty narrow skinny QRS. And then we're temporarily to check the right ventricular lead. In this example, we're doing right ventricular pacing and you see only one pacemaker spike in a much wider QRS. This is a dramatic explanation or demonstration, I should say, of how you can get more simultaneous activation in a narrow QRS during bi -V pacing versus single site pacing. You can see it side by side in this same patient. Now, sometimes patients with cardiomyopathy 
where we're going to try biventricular pacing, have areas of scarring and slow myocardial conduction, even slower than I showed at the beginning, where normal muscle has a certain conduction velocity. If you have electrical barriers or sick myocardium, you can conduct even more slowly. And so sometimes uh, that left ventricular lead is placed in an area that has slow conduction due to scar, in which case we're going to be less effective at creating a more simultaneous contraction of the walls of the myocardium because as you pace from that left ventricular lead, it's going to take longer to conduct away from that site. And therefore, you're going to need, if you want to fuse more successfully, you're going to need more of a head start pacing from that lead compared to the right ventricular lead. And that's called VV timing, ventriculoventricular timing. We can alter and tailor the relative time between one lead and the other to try to create the best fusion complex that we possibly can. So here is an example of pacing simultaneously, let's say, uh, from both leads where we are not really contributing as much as we would like from that left ventricular lead. There's only a small territory contributing to fusion and the QRS complex will look mostly like right ventricular pacing, which sort of defeats the purpose uh, of biventricular pacing in the first place. So here is an example of the same patient where we adjusted the timing between the left ventricular and the right ventricular leads up top. We gave that LV lead only a little small head start, maybe 20 or 30 milliseconds. And down at the bottom, you see a wider spacing between the two ventricular pacing stimuli of close to 80 milliseconds. Um, and as a result here, because you had slow conduction from that left ventricular lead, this looks pretty wide, more like right ventricular only pacing. Whereas here we get a narrower QRS because we give a head start that wavefront takes time to break out and then it fuses more successfully with right ventricular pacing to give more simultaneous electrical activity and then hopefully more simultaneous mechanical activity. It's very important where that second lead is placed when you're trying to do biventricular pacing because you want to place that left ventricular lead in the area of myocardium that has been activated late, which if the right ventricular lead is placed at the apex, then the late part is going to be over here at the lateral base as far as possible from that right ventricular lead. If you place a left ventricular lead all the way down toward the apex, close to where that right ventricular lead is pacing, then you're really going to leave that late part still being relatively late. You're pacing from two sites that are sort of close to each other, which again defeats the purpose of trying to achieve myocardial fusion and a narrow QRS and a more simultaneous activation of the walls of the left ventricle. So if that lead is placed either on the inferior septum or the anterior septum or way out in the apex, those are less effective locations for biventricular pacing. So when we implant leads for biventricular pacing, we have to be very cognizant of the exact anatomic place where we put it in order to achieve proper fusion and proper electrical synchrony to help that left ventricle pump in a more efficient fashion. So far, I've been talking about biventricular pacing in the context of pacing from one versus two locations. But the most common scenario where we talk about biventricular pacing is actually in patients with cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and a left bundle branch block. And let me show you why that is. The desynchrony of the walls of the left ventricle during a left bundle branch block is very similar to the desynchrony during right ventricular apical pacing. When we pace from the right ventricular apex, as we said, the wavefront travels slowly and activates the lateral base of the left ventricle late. But similarly, when you have a left bundle branch block, you're conducting down the right bundle, which inserts also in the right ventricular apex location. And then that wavefront travels from that location, again, across sequentially the walls of the left ventricle to the lateral, posterolateral base of the left ventricle as well. So a left bundle branch block QRS scenario is also causing similar desynchrony and then can worsen heart failure and cardiomyopathy as well, just like right ventricular pacing does. And so that's another scenario where you can place a left ventricular lead and pace that late part 
even if you have native conduction occurring as, instead of right ventricular pacing. Now there are different ways to program a pacemaker, a biventricular pacemaker in that scenario. You can say instead of right ventricular pacing, let's allow the, at least the Hisperkinji fibers that are working, let's allow them to conduct down to the myocardium, and then I'll try to piggyback on top of that and pace in the left ventricular lead and fuse with native conduction. And there are ways that devices can try to do that on their own or that we can manually adjust that timing to achieve that end. And the QRS that's fused will look something like this. Here's conduction down the left bundle, the, the right bundle in the setting of a left bundle branch block and simultaneous pacing from that left ventricular lead, again, creating fusion. The QRS will be a blend between the left bundle branch block and pacing from that left ventricular lead, and you'll create a more narrow and simultaneous electrical activation and therefore mechanical activation of the walls of the left ventricle. And that's a common way that biventricular devices can be programmed nowadays if the patient has intact conduction with a left bundle branch block. Here's an example of a patient with a left bundle branch block QRS that is wide and dyssynchronous, causing and worsening heart failure. And in this same patient, we put in a biventricular device and there's only one pacer spike that's basically uh, fusing and occurring at the beginning of the QRS. And we created an overall narrower QRS rather than native conduction because we are pacing that late part and bringing it in and creating a fused complex with more simultaneous electrical activity. You can also program the device to pace from the right ventricular lead as well, in which case you'll get triple fusion. You activate the ventricular myocardium from three places, native conduction down the right bundle branch, if it's somebody with a left bundle branch block, from the right ventricular lead and from the left ventricular lead. And it would look something like this. Here we are, conduction and pacing from two sites. Now, because right ventricular pacing is not helping so much in this scenario, it's basically mimicking conduction down the right bundle branch. Usually we program this type of device if we allow right ventricular pacing to occur with left ventricular pacing significantly earlier than right ventricular pacing. Um, and, uh, and therefore right ventricular pacing usually contributes the least to the overall QRS, but it is contributing something usually if, it's, if you're pacing from that location. And you're gonna see then a blended QRS between all three sites. And I'm kind of excited to get into that in greater depth. You've heard the expression that two wrongs don't make a right. Well, I'm gonna show you a situation where three wrongs do make a right. Here's a patient with a left bundle branch block and cardiomyopathy and heart failure. And you can see that this native left bundle branch block QRS is wide for all the reasons we've discussed several times. And you can see in lead V1 that the end of the QRS is negative because the wavefront is traveling from front to back from right ventricle toward left ventricle away from V1. And this person had a biventricular device put in with right ventricular and left ventricular leads. And let's look at what right ventricular pacing looks like. Just what we discussed before, similar to a left bundle branch block QRS, it's wide. It's again negative at the end of V1. So it looks very similar in that regard to the native left bundle branch block. In contrast, if we paste only from the left ventricular lead, it's gonna give you a very different morphology. It's still wide because now we're not fused. All of these three scenarios are exclusive stimulation from one location. Um, and with left ventricular pacing, that location is over on the lateral base of the left ventricle. If we pace only from that site, you're gonna get a wide QRS alone, and it's gonna have a very different vector. It's gonna have a very positive QRS in V1 because we're pacing the left ventricle. It's gonna have a wavefront that travels toward the right ventricle, which is also coming forward toward V1. And so we, uh, we now have three different ways of making wide QRSs, none of them alone are, called, are synchronous in terms of the electrical activation of the walls of the myocardium and therefore not showing mechanical synchrony either. But if you can blend these three wide QRSs in different ways by changing the timing between the pacing and native conduction or between the left ventricular and right ventricular leads, you can make a whole variety of fused QRS complexes, including 
ones and is, that are narrower than any of these three. So by taking three wide QRSs and blending them in triple fusion in various ways, we can create QRSs that are narrower than any of them and in fact almost replicate a narrow QRS just like the Hisperkinji tree can do. Not quite as well, but close. So let's look at fusion between these three. Here are those three locations, just as a reminder. And here is a patient who has their device programmed with a very short AV delay. That's the timing between atrium and ventricle. Not a lot of time to let native conduction occur, only 50 milliseconds, which is pretty short. And this device is programmed with the left ventricular lead 50 milliseconds in front of we call that negative, in front of the right ventricular lead. So here is a blended QRS between all of these three, and we can try to figure out the relative contributions of each of those three, and I've color-coded them so that this is a little bit more clear and easy to follow. In this scenario, as I implied, native conduction is playing a very little role here, um, as, as shown in this sort of pie chart, which is basically going to show us the relative contributions of each of these three QRSs to this triple fused QRS. And the reason that there isn't much contribution of native conduction is because the device is programmed with a very short AV timing. We're telling the device jump in really quickly with pacing and don't give much opportunity for native conduction to occur. And similarly, there's much more blue left ventricular pacing contribution than right ventricular contribution because we're giving the left ventricular lead a 50 millisecond head start. So how do I know this? The way that I figure out what is contributing to the fused QRS is by trying to find a unique property of one of the three that is not present in the other two. And let me show you what I mean. So for example, with native conduction, and I put a yellow dot here uh, to look at lead two. During native conduction, we see a positive QRS here, where it is in neither of the other two, neither right ventricular nor left ventricular pacing. In this particular patient, do we see any positive component of the QRS? So if we see fusion where there is positivity in lead two, that tells us how much contribution there is from native conduction. And we don't see very much, which is consistent with the short AV delay and why I've signified very small part of the pie chart in yellow native conduction. Let's look at the green uh, dot that I put down here, which is going to give us a clue as to how much RV pacing is contributing to the fused QRS. Notice in lead AVL, RV pacing gives you a very positive QRS, but not very positive in AVL in either native conduction or left ventricular pacing. So if we see positivity in AVL in the fused QRS, that tells us that there's contribution from right ventricular pacing, and there is some. So we know that right ventricular pacing is contributing. And, but, and lastly, the left ventricular pacing is um, going to be um, hallmarked by the precordial leads. Notice, and I put this long blue bar here, Notice that there is very positive QRS in V1, V2, out here toward V5, whereas in neither of the other two do you have really positive QRSs in those leads. So we can assess what contribution the left ventricular pacing location is making to the fused QRS by looking how positive the fused QRS is in those leads. And it's a fair amount, which is why blue is occupying the majority of the pie chart in this triple fused QRS. Let's look at how adjusting the timing of things will adjust the relative contributions of each of these three ways of stimulating myocardium and therefore the overall fusion and width of the QRS. Here what I've done is I said let's leave the AV delay early so that the native contribution remains pretty low but let's make the left ventricular and right ventricular leads simultaneous about equal. What have we seen in terms of a change in morphology if we're allowing the right ventricular lead to contribute more? Well, the QRS is getting a little bit wider, I believe. It's similar, but the vector is also changing. So remember we said, let's look at the green dot lead AVL to show us how much contribution there is from right ventricular pacing. And we can see from scenario one to scenario two, that AVL lead got more positive, which indicates that we have more fusion contribution from right ventricular 
pacing. And then in the precordial leads, we see that we've gone from positive out here to more isoelectric and even a little bit negative in some of these leads, meaning that left ventricular lead is contributing less. So I put in the pie chart less blue, more green. And let's just for completion's sake, look at yellow. So yellow, we said, okay, if we have native contribution, you should have positivity in lead two. Well, we certainly don't see that here. So we still have very little contribution from native conduction consistent with the very short programmed AV delay. But let's look at creating a little bit more balance and allowing some native conduction to peek through and contribute also to the triple fused QRS. Now what we've done is we've allowed the AV delay, the programmed AV delay to be longer. We said, let's give some opportunity for native conduction down the Hisperkinji system that's working and let that also contribute to the QRS itself. And let's go back and make the left ventricular lead earlier than the right ventricular lead by 50 milliseconds because right ventricular apical pacing really does not create additional synchrony. It's actually counterproductive in terms of wall synchrony of the left ventricle. So what happened here? This is the narrowest QRS of all and we've now generated a more balanced fusion between the three locations of stimulation of the myocardium. And let's review each of them so you see where I, uh, how I composed this pie chart. Let's start with native conduction. As I said, we prolonged the AV delay to allow native conduction to occur. That's in yellow. So here we said in lead two, we see positivity from native conduction. And sure enough, we're seeing some positivity here that's indicating that there's native uh, conduction down the right bundle branch contributing to this triple fused QRS. And then in terms of the right ventricular pacing contribution, um, sorry, here in AVL, we said, let's look at the positivity. And here there is some positivity in, AV, in uh, AVL, but less than either of these two. So there's definitely less right ventricular pacing contribution to the QRS compared to these other two scenarios. Um, and then lastly, let's compare the left ventricular lead. And it's not as positive here because it's being swamped out by more native conduction. Um, so there's sort of a more balanced uh, uh, fusion between the three with allowing native conduction to come through. And this is the most narrow QRS and very likely the most electrically and hopefully mechanically synchronous activation of the left ventricle. And in every patient, you can tailor their AV delay and their VV timing by uh, looking at the surface QRS and starting out by seeing what does each of these three components look like and then you can iteratively run an EKG and make various little changes and see what effects you're having on the QRS as a whole. In recent years, there has been a big paradigm shift in thinking about how we can use pacing to create synchrony in the walls of the left ventricle. Instead of pacing from two myocardial sites, we get back to basics and think about the Hisperkinji tree, which really is the thing that can synchronize the myocardium the best. And the concept came up, it's an old concept, but it was revisited and has now become popular in trying to figure out how we can pace the Hisperkinji system and not just myocardium. For example, in somebody who has heart block uh, and they may have a slow junctional escape, but what if we wanna maintain AV synchrony, but have the Hisperkinji system resurrect with pacing? You can have a pacemaker with two leads, one in the atrium so that the pacemaker can time things based on sinus rhythm. And the second lead, you can screw it in to the bundle of Hiss right up here at the base of the heart. And there are tools and techniques to accomplish this. What do you think the QRS is going to look like if we pace the Hiss bundle? It gets right back to the concept of utilizing the entirety of the Hisperkinji tree. Here we stimulate the Hiss bundle and you create a narrow QRS. This is what it would look like. Very similar, if not identical, to a conducted QRS, except you have a pacer spike in front of it because we're pacing that Hiss bundle. And here's what it looks like in a patient who has a Hiss bundle pacing lead. This patient presented with complete heart block and was in a slow escape rhythm. And this patient had a dual chamber pacemaker implanted. And there is an atrial lead so that the pacemaker could time the pacing according to sinus rhythm. And the ventricular lead was attached to the base of the right ventricle 
right where the His bundle sits. And if you didn't know better and you didn't see the pacer spikes, you would think that this looked like just native conduction down the his Purkinje system. But in fact, there are pacer spikes there. And that is because this pacemaker has a his bundle pacing lead. And it is pacing the bundle of his because conduction on its own was not occurring. Again, the patient presented with heart block. And you can create a narrow QRS, which again replicates nature in creating a synchronous activation of the walls of the left ventricle. If you looked really carefully on that EKG, you might notice that the QRS didn't exactly look completely narrow. In fact, it's somewhat reminiscent a little bit of the delta wave that we saw from WPW. You can see there's this little bit here that's a little bit sluggish before you see the rapid narrow QRS. So if you think about this QRS, just like in WPW, in two components, there's the rapid skinny part, and that reflects capture of the His bundle and conduction down the entirety of the Hisperkinji tree and activation of the ventricular muscle very quickly. The first part, though, actually reflects local myocardial conduction. This pacemaker lead is not only capturing the bundle of His, but also local muscle of the top of the septum. And that is responsible for that little delta wave appearance. Just like the pink region that we showed in WPW, we have a little green region from pacing here capturing myocardium, but then the Hisperkinji system immediately takes over and creates a pretty rapid uh, narrow QRS, almost identical to what would have happened if conduction were occurring on its own. Sometimes the His bundle is not easily paced or not amenable to capture. Let's say there is disease in the proximal part of the left bundle branch. So if you tried to pace the His region, it might conduct down with a left bundle branch block morphology. And that is not what we're looking to accomplish if we're trying to get synchrony of the walls of the left ventricle. So you can, in that scenario, uh, place a lead more distal in the Hisperkinji system and try to pace the left bundle directly. The way we typically do that is we place a lead further down on the septum in the right ventricle and we can screw the lead deeper into the myocardium, into the septum, almost all the way to the endocardium of the left ventricle but not protruding into the cavity of the left ventricle and we uh, can find anatomically the location of the left bundle branch and pace that. And here you'd also be pacing both myocardium and the left bundle itself. And notice that now we have a little bit wider QRS and it looks like a right bundle branch block morphology rather than the skinny narrow QRS that we had when we paced the His bundle directly. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is if we're capturing the left bundle branch, that's going to give you a QRS appearance that looks just like a right bundle branch block scenario where you conduct down the left bundle branch. It's basically the same thing, except we're electrically pacing it rather than allowing it to conduct from above. You have, just like in a right bundle branch block scenario, you have a QRS that's a little bit wider than normal narrow QRS, and the end of the QRS in V1 is positive. That is because at the, you capture the left bundle, and then the wave front at the end is coming from the left ventricle toward the right ventricle, which is back to front toward V1, and it looks just like a right bundle branch block QRS, but you're pacing. And this is what that would look like. You can see the lead here in the mid of the mid part of the septum, screwed through the septum, and the distal electrode is right abutting the left bundle uh, itself. And uh, you can capture that and create a pretty synchronous uh, activation of the left ventricle by hijacking at least that left bundle branch. Here you're pacing conducting down that part of the tree, stimulating the left ventricle pretty quickly. And I showed in green here that you're also capturing myocardium. And then just like in the right bundle branch block scenario, slow conduction from the captured tissue and the captured fascicles um, over toward the, the uh, right ventricle. And it'll give you that shaped QRS. So let's think about some of the things that we've learned during this video presentation about the QRS, its width and its shape. We learned that the QRS is generated by wavefronts that propagate out from the one or more sites of stimulation. And we learned that if you stimulate the myocardium at only one place, that'll give you the widest QRS because you are going to propagate only through myocardial tissue and you're not leveraging the his Purkinje tree. That is true whether we're talking about a PVC coming from myocardium or we are pacing at one location in the myocardium, 
or in the rare scenario that you're conducting over an accessory pathway and not conducting down the his purkinje system at the same time. The shape of the QRS when you're stimulating the myocardium from one site will tell you about where that location is. And that allows us, for example, to pinpoint the origin of a PVC for the purpose of planning an ablation procedure, uh, such as from the right ventricular or left ventricular outflow tract or a papillary muscle or wherever the PVC should be coming from. And also can help us pinpoint where pacing uh, may be coming from as well if we're pacing from one location. If two or more sites both stimulate the myocardium during the same beat, you're going to get fusion of the QRS. The QRS shape will be a blend of what each of those sites would have caused on its own, and the net result will almost always be a narrower QRS than either one alone. And again, the shape and vector will be a blend of the two or more sites together. The Hisperkinji tree creates the most narrow QRS possible because we're stimulating the myocardium from lots of places all at once throughout the endocardium of the right and the left ventricle. And this is seen during normal native conduction, during junctional tachycardia from the His bundle that conducts down the entirety of the tree, during a junctional escape that originates from the His bundle and conducts down the entire tree, or during His bundle pacing where we're stimulating that His bundle and conducting down the entire tree. If you have stimulation from only a branch of the tree, you're going to get a rapid initial part of the QRS, but the overall QRS will be wider and the end of the QRS will reflect myocardial conduction. And this is true when you have aberrant conduction from the atria, that is right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block conduction. That is true if you have a fascicular tachycardia, meaning a fast rhythm coming from one of the bundles or an escape rhythm in the setting of heart block where your, your spot that has taken over as a new pacemaker is coming from one of the fascicles, or if you're pacing a fascicle, such as in the context of left bundle branch pacing. And lastly, you can leverage the concept of fusion to achieve more synchrony of the left ventricular walls with various pacing strategies. If you have a left bundle branch block, or right ventricular apical pacing, then you're going to have dyssynchrony in the electrical activity and therefore the mechanical contraction of the walls of the left ventricle. And we can at least partially correct that uh, by pacing at the late spot, spot that is not being activated promptly during the left bundle branch block or right ventricular pacing. That's biventricular pacing. Or more recently, we can try to pace the conduction system directly and leverage the his Purkinje tree to do the work for us. I hope that this presentation was helpful in thinking about the EKG and telemetry strips and understanding how the QRS is created rather than memorizing. And I hope that you'll take this back to your practice and understand EKGs better and they make more sense in the big picture.